When the war started, we all thought that Krantz would hold out for a long time, as they had a seemingly impenetrable line of defenses. However, that was obviously not the case, and only through a miraculous evacuation were the Allies not completely crushed. With the fascists now in control of most of the mainland, only one island nation stood alone to oppose them. Even with all of this, my nation was yet to officially join the conflict. But I figured, if we truly were about liberty and freedom, I needed to get involved. So I made my way over, and was going to offer my aeronautic expertise to the Royal Air Force. At this point, the Royal Air Force was already heavily involved in the defense of their island. As the fascists were aggressively attacking their airfields, Shortly after crossing the pond and arriving to help my country's future ally, the airbase came under attack from three ME-110s. A wing of hurricanes quickly rose up to meet them. As I watched the air battle unfold, a young officer helped me find cover. His name was Will Kermit. It turns out he was one of the evacuees at Kirkdun. And while it looks like the Royal Air Force is doing a great job defending the island and seems to be well equipped for that task, Will expressed a desire to be able to hit back at the fascists, to cross the channel and start bombing their positions instead of being raided by the fascists every day. Will also pointed out to me that one of the pilots up there was actually one of the Kropolskis that evacuated with him from Kirkdun. This is when I was able to explain to Will that I was an aeronautic engineer and I was going to help his country develop a long-range bomber so that they could strike back at the fascists. Will then explained that before he became a tanker, he was studying to become a mechanical engineer. So I asked that Will be transferred over to the bomber development project as well as his friend Leon, who was an experienced pilot. Both of those requests were approved. A large section of the fuselage was designed to be a payload bay that could hold a variety of different munitions and bombs, which, in all likelihood, many of those bombs had not even been invented yet. So we needed to do our best to future-proof the aircraft. Bombing Command did have a fair amount of experience flying multi-engine bombers, but this was going to be a new class. This is to be a heavy bomber, unlike the twin-engine medium-sized bombers that they had been flying before. This larger bomber is set to have quite the complement of crew. It has space for a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, radio operator, and tail gunner. The bomber will also need a fairly substantial main wing. The main wings will need to be able to keep this heavy bomber in the air for long distances. Unlike the twin-engine bombers, this is designed to go beyond raiding the coast and strike deep inside fascist territory. During the development of the bomber, Leon asked what a good name for this aircraft should be. And personally, I had no idea. Will gave the suggestion of Lancaster, as he thought Bomber Command would approve of something like that. Will, as it turned out, was correct, and the name would end up sticking. Little did we know at the time, but after the war, this aircraft would become one of the iconic symbols of Bomber Command. As you can see during the aircraft's development, the wings are pretty substantial. As a matter of fact, the aircraft is wider than it is long, and quite noticeably so. But that just means that the wings will produce a lot of lift and enable this aircraft to carry many kilograms of bombs and drop them on the enemy positions deep inside enemy territory. The distal two-thirds of the wing were given a dihedral angle. This helped keep the aircraft more stable. Being that we are developing a heavy bomber as opposed to a fighter, Stability was a desirable trait. Differing from my country's flying fortress design of aircraft, this bomber 
has two vertical stabilizers attached to the outside edges of the horizontal stabilizers. There are some advantages to using two vertical stabilizers instead of one. One advantage is that they don't have to be nearly as large. Another advantage is that if the aircraft is equipped with a dorsal mounted machine gun position, then that position has a clear field of fire towards the back side of the aircraft. As mentioned previously, this aircraft is to be a four engine design. But even with four large engines, the aircraft will struggle to exceed 200 meters per second. The wing positions will need to be carefully balanced as the center of aerodynamic pressure will need to remain slightly behind the center of mass. And if this is then done correctly, the aircraft will remain still fairly agile for its size. Throughout the aircraft's development, the exact position of the wings and the engines will continually be tweaked. It is also very important to factor in how the center of mass will shift throughout the flight, such as how it will shift when fuel is used, as well as what happens when bombs are added to the aircraft and what happens after they are dropped. Thus, designing and testing can be a rather tedious task. But the safer and better that the aircraft is designed, the more likely pilots will be to come home. Now that most of the basic aircraft components are incorporated, it's time to start turning this thing into a military aircraft. Key components such as weapons managers and defensive machine gun positions are now incorporated into the design. This plane will not be the highest flying or fastest thing out there, so it will need a fair amount of defensive machine gun positions to help keep enemy fighters away. The amount that the machine guns can rotate is limited so that the gunner can't accidentally shoot the aircraft. There are now just a couple things left to finalize the design, with one thing being the landing gear. This airplane is going to use a conventional or tail dragger arrangement as it's sometimes called. The rear landing gear will be a little shorter than the front landing gear. This will make takeoff just a little bit easier for the pilots. And the final task is to paint the aircraft. In all likelihood, different squadrons will have different paint schemes that they will use. But for our first one, a simple gray color will be used for the test flight. For a test flight, Leon will help pilot the aircraft with Will and myself operating as navigator and engineer on the flight. This is not a combat mission, it's just the very first test flight of the aircraft, so no bombs have been loaded into the ordnance bay. The flight plan is to head basically directly east. This means that almost the entire flight will be over open seas. But at the very end of the aircraft's journey, we should be over fascist-controlled coastline. We're not really expecting to encounter any fascist activity in this area. It just should be a good and safe test for the aircraft to see what it is capable of and how far it can fly. As the sun begins to rise in the east, off to our right, we can just begin to see some coastline. That is all fascist-controlled territory. Where? Assuming everything goes okay in this first test flight, and that this aircraft can be produced in sufficient numbers, soon bombing missions will be flying over that territory. As we approach the end of this leg of the mission, Will switches out from the radio position and begins scanning through the bombing site. Leon is saying that he thinks he sees there's something down there. As Will looks through the site, he sees some kind of strange plane, some kind of flying wing, and a new weapon system. What is that? It appears we've just stumbled across an enemy testing range. I'm going to request that we be allowed to form a team that can investigate these enemy secret weapons programs that they have going on. It looks like this new airplane could be a very successful bomber and weapon against the enemy. But what kind of new weapons are they developing? And will the Allies be able to stop or counter these new weapons that the fascists are making? 
Having worked for some time in aircraft development, I've seen a lot of crazy designs. However, at this point, I had never seen anything the likes of which the fascists were working on. And little would I realize at the time that that newfangled cruise missile that the fascists had developed was on the mild end compared to what I would see later.